And our speaker is William B. Quant. He is Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. His areas of expertise are the Middle East, American policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict, and our energy policy. He has also been serving as a consultant to ABC News since the outbreak of war in the Gulf. Before coming to Brookings in 1979, Dr. Quant served as a staff member on the National Security Council and was also an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. From 1968 to 1972, he worked at the RAND Corporation in the Department of Social Science. He is the author of a number of books, including Saudi Arabia in the 1980s, Foreign Policy, Security, and Oil, and Decade of Decisions, American Foreign Policy Toward the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1967 to 1976. Dr. Quant has written many articles for publication in journals on foreign affairs, and he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Will you join me in welcoming him this evening to Baltimore, Dr. William B. Quant. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I hope all of you in the back can hear me. If not, maybe if that would do better. Is that any better? OK. Well, thank you again for the introduction. It's very nice to be here in Baltimore on this very lovely spring day, a bit of a surprise at this time of year. I just wish I were here to discuss a somewhat more cheerful topic with you other than war and its likely consequences uh, in the Gulf region. It's a very serious topic. It's uh, often a rather gloomy topic because the things that are happening in the Gulf as we speak are not very pleasant. Uh, bombs are falling, people are being killed on our side and on our adversary's side. But it is a topic that is obviously on many people's minds, your minds, certainly has been on my mind, and so I will try to share with you this evening some of the thoughts that I have about how this war is going to affect our interests and the kind of Middle East agenda that will confront us when the war is over. I've been using a title of the aftermath of the Gulf crisis uh, for some time now on the assumption that this war will end and that we will have a very big agenda confronting us at that point. <clears throat> but I don't feel that I can jump to the end of the story uh, of where we will be when the crisis is over without saying a bit about how we got to where we are today and how the war is likely to end. Now, I obviously don't have the crystal ball that would allow me to give you a clear-cut picture, so I will simply give you some speculation. But we need at least some notion of how the crisis might end if we're going to discuss what will inevitably uh, confront us in the aftermath of the crisis. I think that historians of the future will debate for a long time <clears throat> the question of exactly how this war occurred. And there will be many different theories, and many people will be tempted to speculate about what might have happened if Saddam Hussein had done this or if George Bush had done that. But I don't think that anyone who tries to interpret recent events can ignore the enormous role played in bringing this crisis to the point it is at today of two very powerful men, Saddam Hussein and George Bush. Saddam Hussein, <clears throat> without a doubt, made the crucial decision that sparked this crisis when he decided to invade Kuwait on August 2nd of last year. And then, within just a matter of days, his decision to annex it and declare that it was the 19th province of Iraq. He had many reasons that led him to this decision, economic problems in his own country, political motivations. But I think we should never forget that this man who made this decision that set off this crisis is a man of enormous ambition, of great ruthlessness, and is going to be a very tough adversary. He is also a man who has more than a small streak of paranoia. I learned just the other day that beginning in the fall of 1989, he began to tell Arab leaders 
that he was convinced that George Bush was trying to have him killed. And in fact, he asked the president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, to make a special trip to Washington to confront our president with this charge. And in fact, Mubarak did come to Washington. He said, Saddam Hussein is convinced that you're out to kill him. And Bush, of course, uh, denied any such thing. But I think to understand Saddam Hussein's frame of mind, one has to understand that he did seem to be obsessed with the United States and its plans to weaken Iraq and perhaps to topple his regime. Throughout much of the early part of 1990, Saddam Hussein began to talk in public about the changes that were taking place in the world, the importance of the end of the Cold War and what that would mean for the Middle East. And in a very memorable speech that got no attention in Washington, but a great deal of attention in the Middle East, he said that the end of the Cold War is very bad news for the Arabs because they have counted on the Soviet Union and the so Soviet Union, in his words, has now gone to lick its wounds. He said this leaves us in the Arab world confronting the United States and Israel and that is a formidable challenge that will confront us for at least the next five years. And then he went on to say something that stuck in my mind after reading it. He said, the Americans look very powerful, but we should never forget that in Lebanon, one bomb was enough to drive them out. The Americans look tough, but they don't have the stomach for war, for casualties. They aren't the kind of society that can take large casualties in war. And I think that for the rest of the spring, he kept taunting us by saying that he was thinking about moving against Kuwait, or he was threatening Israel with chemical weapons, and he was testing to see what kind of reaction he would get from the United States. And by and large, he didn't get much of a reaction. There were comments in the press, some people took notice, but by and large, we acted as if it was pretty much business as usual. In a final meeting that he had with our ambassador in Baghdad a week before he ordered the operation, or at least before the Iraqi troops crossed into the border. He said to our, our ambassador that you Americans really don't have the stomach for playing the game in the Middle East. He said, we in Iraq had 10,000 casualties sometimes in one battle with the Iranians during our eight year long war. And of course, you know, he lost probably a quarter of a million people in that war and tens and tens of billions of dollars. He said, you Americans couldn't take those kinds of losses. So you should put your money on Iraq as the only country that can stand up to Iran, and Iran is the real threat confronting you. He was almost offering a kind of alliance. And of course, uh, there was no, no picking up on that. But again, it was indicative that he was pointing to this unwillingness of the United States to confront heavy casualties. And so he made his move, I think, believing that the United States would do nothing. Saddam Hussein, I believe, failed to take into account at least three important actors. First and foremost, President Bush, who, despite Saddam Hussein's assessment that the United States was weak and unwilling to take casualties, turned out to be extremely tough-minded about the need to reverse the blatant Iraqi aggression against Kuwait. Second, I think Saddam Hussein must have been surprised by the reaction of the Saudis, who have never known, been known for having a terrifically strong backbone. They have usually, because they are a weak country, tried to conciliate their neighbors. They are conciliators almost by geographical position. They try to find the consensus position and adhere to it in the hope that no one will get too angry with them. But on this occasion, they realize that their own countries security and certainly possibly the survival of the regime was at stake. And within days, the Saudis asked for direct American military intervention, something almost unprecedented in modern times. And then third, I think the Iraqis must have been surprised by the Soviet Union. It was true, of course, that they recognized that with the end of the Cold War, they could not count on automatic Soviet support. 
But I think they must have been surprised to see the spectacle of the Soviet Union aligning itself with the United States, even to the point of voting in the United Nations Security Council on a resolution authorizing the use of force against Iraq. Well, by late October of last year, the president had really assembled quite a remarkable coalition of forces from within the region and internationally to confront the Iraqi aggression. He had forces in the field, large numbers of them, and at that point he had strong domestic and international support for pursuing a two-track policy of relying on sanctions to put pressure on Iraq and force, if necessary, as a last resort. Then, early in November, I think the president made probably the second most important decision of this crisis, the first being his decision to respond to the Saudi request for help on a massive scale. The second decision was to pursue a policy of brinkmanship to force Saddam Hussein to back down. Now, brinksmanship, for those of you who, who want a a sort of real-world example of how the game is played. It's a bit like uh, the game that teenagers, when I was uh, a bit younger, uh, used to play called chicken. I don't know anybody who really played this, but people talked as if they did, where teenagers would line up at opposite ends of a deserted highway and start driving straight at each other to see who would swerve uh, from the road first. And to a substantial degree from November on, we were engaged in that kind of a challenge. We were not going to swerve, and if war was going to be avoided, Saddam Hussein would have to be the one who backed down. And there were many people, including myself, who thought that at the last minute, Saddam would understand that his country faced a tremendous defeat if he did not swerve. But he didn't, and we now are in the midst of a very serious war. We're about to enter the fourth week, and I can't tell you at this point how much longer it will go on, although I will speculate a bit on that in a moment. Let me say a few words about the things that have been surprising so far about the war, because all the pundits, of course, had it all figured out how it was going to go. It would be over in three days, or it would go on for a year, or there would be revolution throughout the Middle East, or Saddam Hussein would collapse and be overthrown. The real surprises, however, I think have been that in the first phase of this military campaign, our strategy of relying on air power has gone better than anybody could have conceivably hoped in a purely technical sense. You can all remember, I'm sure, the almost euphoria that people felt in the first day that after some 2,000 sorties had been flown, we had virtually no losses. And of course now, after some 30,000 sorties had been flown, we still have remarkably few casualties given on the, on the Allied side, given the nature of the pounding that has been delivered to Iraq. So this is a demonstration that air war can be conducted with very, very low casualties on our side. However, I think we have also had to take into account now, as we near the fourth week of the war, that air power alone, despite the tremendous devastation that it has wrecked on Iraq, has not brought us to a quick end of the war. The regime has not collapsed. The forces in the field have not surrendered. They haven't withdrawn. Their supply lines haven't been disrupted to the point where they are running out of food and water. And their communications links seem to work adequately well. In addition, Iraq still has the capacity to catch us by surprise from time to time with initiatives. They aren't just sitting back and taking the pounding, doing nothing. <clears throat> they have demonstrated an ability almost on a daily basis to launch missiles at Saudi Arabia and Israel. The missiles, fortunately, are not accurate. They don't carry a very heavy payload, and at least to date, they have not carried anything other than conventional warheads. 
Nonetheless, the relative robustness and viability of this missile force has been something of a surprise. I think most specialists thought that it could be eliminated within the first few days. We have also seen his ground forces lash out on a small offensive against the Saudi town of Khafji. Of course, they were turned back at considerable cost. But nonetheless, the ability to mobilize an offensive operation of that sort does suggest that his troops are still taking orders and are in a position to carry out offensive operations, at least on a small scale. We also are beginning to see <clears throat> signs that terrorist activities around the world are being undertaken, probably at direct Iraqi instigation. There was even a report on the radio as I came in that in Norfolk today they, they discovered several pipe bombs near uh, gasoline storage areas or methanol storage areas. And we still don't know if the Iraqis will at some point use their unconventional weaponry, chemical weapons and biological weapons. So I think we have to be prepared for surprises. This is a man who is going to periodically demonstrate to us that there is fight left in his enormous armed forces, even though they have taken a tremendous beating. The third surprise, I think, to some has been that the coalition of forces arrayed against Iraq, which includes a number of Arab forces, Egypt, Syria, the main ones, of course, the Saudis and the Gulf states themselves, has held up remarkably well. The Europeans also, those that have committed forces, are there on the ground participating and in the air carrying out airstrikes along with American pilots. So by and large, the coalition of forces that the president assembled has held up and has actually joined combat on a number of important occasions. I think it was particularly important that when the Iraqis launched their offensive into Saudi territory, that it was not just Americans who responded. There were, in fact, Saudi troops and troops from Qatar uh, who did participate in the, uh, the battle for Kafji. We have also seen, perhaps a bit late in the day, but nonetheless on a substantial scale, a willingness of some countries to contribute financially to the costs of the war. The Saudis and the Kuwaitis, not surprisingly, have picked up a large portion of the bill, recently agreeing between the two of them to about $27 billion worth of support for the war. But also the Germans and the Japanese, as I say, perhaps a bit late in the day, have nonetheless recently come up with substantial uh, offers uh, of contributions. So this is turning out to be a multilateral effort in a number of important ways, both in terms of the troops involved and in terms of the burden sharing of the costs. Another thing that I think has surprised some people has been the reaction of peoples in the Middle East. Some thought that the moment the war began, there would be riots all over the Middle East toppling governments, anti-American riots. That didn't happen immediately, and it led some people to think, well, maybe Saddam Hussein is viewed as such a thug and such a tyrant that, in fact, there is no base of popular support for Iraq. But as we get into the second and third week of this war, I think we have to recognize that popular opinion in the Arab world and in the Islamic world is, in fact, turning strongly anti-Western, anti-American. It's not so much pro-Saddam Hussein as it is sympathy for an Iraq which now seems to be subject to an incredible campaign of bombing. And the perception is taking root that the objective of this war is no longer the liberation of Kuwait, which many people agreed with, including many Arabs, but is now the destruction of an Arab country and a Muslim people. So we're seeing demonstrations in places like Morocco, but also in non-Arab countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh. And I think we have to recognize that there is a strong feeling in some quarters that this is once again an example of the powerful West coming in and trying to impose its will by force on a third world country. Another somewhat surprising development has been this restraint shown thus far by Israel in the face of the attacks by the Scud missiles. 
I think many of us assumed, based on prior uh, Israeli doctrine, that if Israel were hit, they would respond. Obviously, they have chosen not yet to do so, although I wouldn't bet on restraint lasting indefinitely. It has, I think, been a wise decision of the Israelis. They have clearly profited in terms of their political relations with us, with the Europe, Europeans, uh, and at least to date, they have not suffered terribly heavy casualties from the Scud attacks. But I think we must anticipate that at some point, the Israelis, in one way or another, will respond. One other particularly interesting angle of this crisis is, is of course, the role played by Iran. If you think back just a few years, Iran and Iraq were, of course, locked in mortal combat, each trying to essentially topple the other regime. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed in that war. It was really a, a terrible, terrible war for both countries. Iraq emerged in a somewhat stronger position, but by no means covered with glory. And now, just a couple of years after the end of that war, we see the Iranians in a very interesting position of being courted by both the Iraqis, who are desperately trying to get some degree of cooperation from Iran <clears throat> and are getting limited help. And the United States is also in regular contact now with Iran, urging them to remain neutral. It's a wonderful position for a regime that was only a couple of years ago the pariah of the Middle East to be in. And I think we all have to start thinking about Iran in a little bit different terms. It is going to emerge from this crisis as one of the winners. And this is just one more reminder of how quickly things can change in the Middle East. Three years ago, Iran was our enemy and Iraq was our ally. Today, Iraq is our enemy and Iran is a country with which we hope to improve relations. It won't remain that way, but that's the Middle East. <clears throat> now, let me say a few words about how I think the war may come to an end, because that will tell us something about the post-crisis agenda. Uh, obviously, if I'm significantly wrong, if the war comes out much differently, then the agenda of post-crisis issues has to be adjusted accordingly. Saddam Hussein's strategy is clearly to prolong the war. He has told people that he believes that if he can keep the war going until the summer months, and if he can inflict heavy enough casualties on the American forces, that he will eventually turn this into a Vietnam, which will mean that even if he takes tremendous beating, he will ultimately prevail. So look to Saddam Hussein not to surrender at any early point, to keep the war going as long as he can even perhaps after his troops in Kuwait have been defeated. President Bush, by contrast, clearly has exactly the opposite uh, strategy in mind. He wants the war to come to a quick end. He wants it to end decisively. And he wants the casualties to be kept as low as possible. We have been very, very lucky so far in the number of casualties on the American and Allied side. And obviously, that helps to account for the very high levels of support that the President enjoys. In every previous war that the United States has fought in recent times, there is a direct relationship between support for the war and casualties incurred. So if the casualties go up, popular support will go down. Now, the dilemma for the President is that if he wants to end the war quickly, he's going to have to send in the ground forces. Air power alone will eventually prevail, but it may take months to crush this enormous Iraqi army that is well provisioned, well dug in, and very resistant. If we want a quick end to the war, that is within weeks or a month or two, at some point we are probably going to have to order ground forces into action. And that's, of course, where casualties can go up. either by our own fire, as we unfortunately, tragically saw this past week, or by enemy fire. In one day, in this minor little ground incursion uh, last week, we suffered more casualties than we did in the entire preceding part of the war. 
seven of which were inflicted by our own forces. That's just a foretaste of what the ground war could be like. Now, I think that the strategy that the President will follow is most likely going to be to rely for at least another two weeks or so on very heavy attacks on the Iraqi forces in and around Kuwait. At that point, when those forces have been sufficiently weakened, he may then decide on ground action in the hopes that this will quickly lead to a cutting off of the forces in Kuwait, their forced surrender, or their destruction. And at that point, we will be on the verge of having accomplished our basic objectives. If we are lucky, then, the war could be over within a month or two. That, however, will not be the end of the challenge that confronts us in the region. Let me just take another five, maybe 10 minutes maximum to go over the kind of issues that I think we already should begin to think about as a people, because the last thing that we can count on when this war is over is simply packing up and leaving the Middle East in the hope that we have now brought stability to this region where we have truly vital interests. We are stuck with a very big Middle East agenda for a very long time into the future. On that agenda, there obviously are a whole host of issues involving the security of the region in the aftermath of the war. I'm not going to dwell on these issues, but I'd be happy to discuss them greater, at greater length during the discussion period. But just to give you the headlines, I think that in Kuwait itself, after it is liberated, we will need some kind of a peacekeeping force, presumably a UN peacekeeping force, but with some Arab component. And I think that can be done, can be done fairly quickly. In fact, it should be done uh, even now. More challenging will be a plausible strategy for defending Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, after all, is where we have the major strategic interest. We've demonstrated in this crisis that Saudi Arabia can be defended, but we also know that Saudi Arabia, left on its own, will always be weaker than even a defeated Iraq and certainly weaker than a resurgent Iran. So one way or another, Saudi Arabia is going to have to be bolstered in its security by some combination of peacekeeping forces from some members of the coalition who are already there, some enhancement of their own military capabilities, and I believe some continued on the ground American presence. We also, I hope, will have the wisdom to look beyond the on the ground arrangements toward the practices that we and our Western allies and the Soviets have engaged in in recent years of essentially selling arms to almost anyone in the Middle East who had the money to pay for them. Iraq and Iran will both be back in the market looking for arms when this crisis is over. And if we or others go back to business as usual, we can be sure that once again, someone will become too strong and too tempted to make a bid for supreme power. So some kind of arms control regimen for the region seems to me now essential. We also, I think, have learned from this crisis the extraordinary danger of weapons of mass destruction in this region. We haven't yet seen them used, but we know some already exist, and some were clearly on the drawing boards. Once again, the main countries that have contributed to this problem <coughs> of nuclear programs in Iraq, chemical weapons in the hands of many countries in the region, are Western European countries and, to some extent, ourselves. These are supposedly private business transactions, but we simply can't allow private business to lead to a nuclearized Middle East or a Middle East with missiles with chemical warheads if we have any capacity to prevent it. Turning from the security agenda for a moment, I think on some level everyone recognizes that stability in the Middle East still has something to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. President Bush, I think, has wisely tried to avoid 
an explicit linkage of the Gulf crisis with the Arab-Israeli conflict, but clearly there is, in the real world, some relationship between what happens in the Gulf and what happens in the Arab-Israeli arena. Otherwise, why would uh, the Iraqis be threatening the Israelis? There is a kind of connection between these two parts of the Middle East. And certainly when this is over, we are once again going to take a good hard look at whether we and our partners in this anti-Iraq coalition, which means the Saudis, the Egyptians, and the Israelis, and, the, uh, and perhaps the Syrians, can find some way to get Arab-Israeli peacemaking back on the agenda. I don't have a magic solution. I have worked most of my career on Arab-Israeli peace issues, and I have rarely been as pessimistic as I am today. But even at a moment like that, when there seems no good opening, we simply cannot drop the issue because it's hard. Many hard issues have challenged us before. Uh, Israelis and Arabs both have incentives to find a way toward peace, and they will need our help if they're going to get there. Let me turn to the next issue on the agenda, uh, and that is the economic agenda. Saddam Hussein has very effectively exploited the issue of the haves versus the have-nots in the region. And there are probably very few parts of the world where the gap is greater. It is true that the Kuwaitis and the Saudis and some of the Gulf Arab states have flaunted their wealth in ways that really are quite offensive. And right next door, they have neighboring countries, Jordan, Egypt, a little further north, Turkey, to their south, Yemen, who are among the poorer countries of the world. And I think if we do not manage to persuade our wealthy Arab partners that they must be more forthcoming with some of their resources to help bring about genuine economic development, if we don't do that and if they don't see the wisdom in that, then some future demagogue will come along in a few years, once again exploiting this issue of the rich versus the poor, and there will be an audience for that theme. I think we have to do what we can to try to take that issue away from the demagogues of the future and demonstrate that we and the oil-rich Arabs are sensitive to the genuine needs of some of the countries in the area who simply uh, do not have adequate resources and need uh, an economic boost. Egypt certainly stands out as the prime candidate. They have played a splendid role in this crisis in support of our objectives, and yet they are miserably poor by comparison, even with a, a country like Syria and certainly with Iraq. But compared to the Saudis, they are at the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, there are other things we will have to do, including figure out whether we ever want to have an energy policy in this country. But I think I will uh, move beyond uh, the agenda and bring my comments to a close for now. I think that during this crisis, we have had a glimpse of what President Bush has in mind when he talks about a new world order. On the one hand, early on in the crisis, we saw a president who seemed genuinely determined to act in concert with our allies and to find new allies in the region. And he really did a remarkable job when you think of it. He uh, almost single-handedly put together a coalition of some 28 countries aligned against Iraq, including the Soviets, the Europeans, a number of Arab countries. And on the whole, I think that is one part of what he has in mind when he talks about a new world order. That is a kind of multilateral approach using the United Nations, leaving force as a last resort, trying to use economic sanctions to impose penalties on aggressor states, and it's a rather optimistic view of the world. It's actually the view that was envisaged when the United Nations was formed in 1945. But as we have gotten deeper into the crisis and now into the war, the other part of the new world order is asserting itself, and that is a kind of American-led use of force to achieve our objectives. No other country in the world is in a position to carry out the kind of military campaign we are carrying out. So there's something inevitable about American leadership, 
in this phase. We are way out ahead of everyone else. This is our war, even though we are fortunate to have some who are participating with us. But the decisions are made here. They're not being made in consultation. This is an 80, 90 percent American effort, and we will ultimately bear most of the price. And it is always difficult to find the balance between American unilateralism, acting when we think we must, and a kind of multilateralism collective security model that we saw earlier in the crisis. One thing seems to me fairly clear, though, that the president is genuinely an internationalist. There is no sense in which, when this crisis is over, he is going to say, now let's go back and turn to our domestic agenda. In fact, if anything, he seems rather bored by our domestic agenda. Uh, but there is still a question of whether he is going to be an internationalist in the sense that he was early on in the crisis, really trying to forge a kind of collective response to the problems that confront us, a sharing of the burdens and a sharing of the decisions, trying to use the UN mechanism where possible in the hopes that eventually we will not always have to be the policemen of the world, or whether out of this show of force he and others will conclude that the United States has the ability and the right to be the policeman of the world. I hope that in his wisdom, he sees the merit of keeping a broad coalition together, of acting multilaterally, because although in the course of war, we can perhaps conduct the war primarily as an American exercise, the challenge of peacemaking is going to require many, many partners in the region in Europe, Soviet Union as well, Japanese. And there in particular, we're going to need all the help we can get. The agenda that I sketched of security issues, of economic issues, of peacemaking issues cannot be handled by the United States alone. If we are going to have a chance to bring about a more stable and peaceful Middle East, which I believe is what this crisis is all about, we are going to need to genuinely operate in the frame of reference of the new world order as the president sketched it out in the early phase of this crisis. He has done, in my judgment, a remarkable job in demonstrating that the United States will not allow blatant aggression to take place without a penalty. He is conducting the war in a serious and determined manner. I hope now, as we approach the end of the war, that the same skills can be brought to the task of peacemaking. Thank you very much. How can we expect to bring peace between the rich Arab countries and the poor Arab countries when Iraq, that was one of the richest country in oil in the Middle East, spent the money on weapons and made a debt of 80 to 100 billion dollars spent on, uh, on weapons and nothing for their own country? The, uh, the question, I believe, is how can you expect stability in the Middle East if indeed the wealthy Arab states uh, spend the money on defense needs rather than upon either the good of their own people or other poor people in the Arab world? Is that approximately call, the question? Yes. I wouldn't call defense needs. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Defense being a kind of euphemism for military in the yeah. modern world. Mr. Well, it's a very good question, and there, of course, is no simple answer. There is no way of preventing a country from squandering its resources if it is determined to do so. There is, however, at least some chance that some of the countries that have traditionally poured arms into the Middle East may be more prepared now to show some self-restraint. We're paying a tremendously high cost for the kind of policies that we pursued in the past. And I have to believe that at least we have a chance of persuading some of the arms sellers not to go back to business as usual when it comes to Iraqi requests. Iran has not yet tried to rearm on a substantial scale. We still have a chance of 
imposing some constraints there, but I admit it's going to be a very tough job. Uh, we can speak for our own country. Do we always have to say yes when somebody asks for arms? Well, it's sometimes difficult to say no, especially when they're paying in petrodollars. But I think if we have a strategy for the region, it has to include a multilateral attempt, which really means today the United States, the Soviet Union, France, Britain, and China, to try to, sh to exercise restraint on our side. We can't necessarily expect restraint on the part of the countries in the region. But it's going to be a while before Iraq is in a position to have the resources to buy an awful lot of new weapons. And during the time that we have when this crisis is over, and before we start pouring arms back into the region, I think we ought to put high on our agenda some kind of a regional arms control effort. The first you, gentleman at the you microphone, have, uh, please. You've given us your agenda for post-war Kuwait. Can you give us your agenda for post-war Iraq? Yeah. Do you want to repeat that? Or? I, I think no. that's concise. Okay. The, the agenda for post-war Iraq. Well, first, I hope that we have in mind an outcome of the war that does not result in the destruction of the country and its partition. Uh, the Middle East is a messy enough place with the states that exist, but I am deeply persuaded that if Iraq is weakened to the point where literally its neighbors are tempted to prey on the carcass that remains, we are going to set the stage for uh, even worse conflicts in the future. Turkey could be tempted to intervene in the north, perhaps even for defensive re reasons. Uh, Iran would almost certainly then react by trying to intervene in the south where there is a large Shiite population, co-religionists. The Saudis would get hysterical at that point. I'm not sure what they would do, but they would feel terribly threatened. Syria might march in and take a bit of western Iraq. Uh, that's not going to bring about more peace in the Middle East. It is going to bring about a formula for future conflicts between perhaps Iran and others in the region. So I hope that actually Iraq survives as a unitary state within its existing borders. I think it's a very bad mistake to start carving countries up and doling them out to their neighbors. It almost always sets the stage for future conflicts. And I hope we realize that destroying Iraq should not be our objective. We have already eliminated most of Saddam Hussein's offensive military capabilities. Within another week or so, we will have done virtually everything that can be done with air power to bring about that result. The remaining objective then is to get his forces out of Kuwait, and when we have done that, I think we should stop. There are those who think we should occupy Iraq as we did Germany and Japan after World War II. It would be a terrible mistake. We would give fuel to every Islamic movement in the region, not just in the Arab world, but in Pakistan, uh, elsewhere in the Islamic world, and we would see a whole new anti-American movement from Morocco all the way across the, the Islamic world. Uh, we have no interest in that kind of outcome. We can live with a weakened Iraq, even if it is still headed by an unpleasant leader, as it is quite likely to be. The second microphone, please, in the rear. You mentioned your interest in uh, Arab-Israeli uh, relations. If you had a magic wand, what uh, would you propose for the solution of the Israeli-Palestinian problem now? What uh, would I propose for a solution of the Israeli-Palestinian problem? Well, first of all, I think the, the art in this business is not to have an American-designed plan that gets imposed on the parties, but that's a little bit of a cop-out. I do have an idea in mind that I think we should at least encourage, although we can't make it happen. Ultimately, it's going to be Israelis and Palestinians who decide how or whether they manage to uh, live together. But I start with the assumption that Israel cannot readily swallow the West Bank and Gaza with 1.7 million Arabs and remain a democratic society, even with the large number of new immigrants. That will pose Israel with a long-term problem of ruling over initially uh, 
a restive minority, and eventually, eventually, a majority. The alternative of expelling the Arabs, simply putting them on trucks and driving them across the river and saying, uh, now we have the territory without the population, I find it very difficult to imagine Israel doing. If they do it, I think the reaction in the world will be very strong. So one way or another, the settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, problem involves a process that ultimately disentangles Israelis from Palestinians so that they are not as intimately tied up in each other's affairs, which means some kind of autonomy, eventually self-government for the Palestinians. I think in Gaza there's no problem. The Israelis don't really care much about Gaza, but in the West Bank. Uh, with a more or less long-term arrangement whereby Israeli security interests in the West Bank, which are obviously substantial, are guaranteed and protected by Israeli forces themselves. But I don't see that the Israelis have any need to keep on governing as they do today the 1.7 million Palestinians under their control. What they need is security. So I, well, I happen to be involved in the Camp David negotiations, so I'm probably biased. That agreement, which Israel signed, which we endorsed, envisaged an initial transitional period during which the West Bank and Gaza and their Arab populations would be put under some kind of an interim authority based on the concept of self-government prior to a final negotiation which would settle the issues of borders and security and recognition and peace and so forth. I still can't think of a better process. I do think at the end of the road, the Palestinians have to be linked politically in some form to Jordan. We're going to have to have some kind of a Jordanian, Palestinian, and perhaps even Jordanian, Palestinian, Israeli confederation, federation that structures political relations so that Israelis run their affairs, Palestinians and Jordanians run their affairs, but the security issues are the subject of a different agreement in which Israel has a dominant voice. It sounds complicated, it, it will be, but the alternative of not finding a political solution will be to have a source of instability that is going to poison the political atmosphere in the region and ultimately perhaps bring down the Egyptian-Israeli peace if it isn't solved. The, uh, the uh, general question is, would you comment on the uh, uh, question of settlement of Palestinians in the future and specifically uh, the possibility of their settlement within Iraq? You know, I think the, the time has passed where we can settle problems of deep national sentiment by saying, where's an empty spot on the globe, or where is there a place where we can move some people aside and make place for somebody else? It, you just don't solve problems that way. One would not have solved in the early 20th century the problem of the homelessness of the Jewish people by putting them in Kenya, which some people expected. They wanted to go to Palestine. The Palestinians don't want to go to Iraq. They also want to go to Palestine, and that's the problem. Uh, it's not that they can't live other places. Many of them live in this country, they live in Canada, they live in Europe, but that doesn't solve the political problem. One way or another, if there is going to be an Arab-Israeli peace and a Palestinian-Israeli peace, we're going to have to find some way for this little speck of land, the historic area of Palestine, to accommodate two homelands, one for the Jewish people and one for the Palestinians. I just don't think there is any way around it. Now, inevitably, many Palestinians will never live in their homeland just as many Jews aren't going to live in their homeland. But if we're going to see a reconciliation of these two talented peoples, each is going to have to have something that they call their own there, not in Florida or not in uh, <laughs> Australia or wherever else. It just doesn't work. You've talked about a new Middle East agenda, and I was curious how Jordan would be a part of that. Well, you know, King Hussein has one overriding objective in this crisis, and that is to survive. And he's doing it, and we should be glad. As irritating as it may sometimes be to see countries and regimes that we have supported
end up on the different, a different side from where we are today, we have an interest in Jordan surviving under the kind of leadership that King Hussein has provided. He hasn't been a perfect leader. No one else in that region has been. But by and large, he has been a force for moderation and stability. And any alternative in Jordan is going to be much, much more difficult. Forget about Jordan as the Palestinian homeland, Sharon's fantasy. It's not going to solve anything. It will simply give the Palestinians an easier jumping off point for conducting the campaign for what they really want, which is a part of what they view as their homeland. Forget about uh, an Islamic movement taking over Jordan and turning inward. It won't. It will have ambitions, again, to pursue the conflict with Israel. King Hussein has the advantage of experience. He's a smart man. And I think that the president was very wise last, whenever it was, I'm losing track of dates, whenever he gave his press conference, I think a, a week ago Friday, in his last question, he really went out of his way to say, when this is over, we want to have good relations with Jordan. We will hold out our hand for conciliation. Jordan has a place in the Middle East when this is over. And I think that's the attitude we should adopt toward a country which, by and large, serves a very useful role as a buffer between, on the one hand, Syria and Saudi Arabia, and between Israel and Iraq. We're Jordan not there, we would want to invent it. Yes, sir. I'd like to mention Vietnam, Nicaragua, Grenada, not necessarily in that order, Santo Domingo, um, most recently Panama. And I wish you would tell me once again what vital interests of this nation are served by this mighty nation intervening once again in the affairs of a third-rate, third-world nation. Why, what are we doing this for? The, uh, the question, of course, is to identify American interests in the current struggle. I think that's what he'll try to do in a moment, please. It's, it's a very valid question. I guess I have been talking about that issue so much, and the President's been talking about it so much, that I just didn't think I had much to add. But let me restate what I think they, they genuinely are. Now, that will reveal the kind of role I see for the United States in the world. I am not an isolationist. I am also not one who believes that the United States should be the policeman of the world, intervening everywhere. I don't believe in Pax Americana. But I do believe that there are occasions, and I would not have supported the use of force in all of the cases that you mentioned. But there are cases in the world where countries behave so badly that they deserve to pay a price. The aggression against Kuwait was absolutely blatant. The annexation of a member state of the United Nations should not go unpunished. Now, one can argue over whether we should have used force or whether we should have relied on sanctions longer. I would have favored relying longer on sanctions. But ultimately, I don't think Saddam Hussein would have backed down without the confrontation with military power. Now, what if we hadn't reacted at all? Well, Saddam Hussein would then have moved on, either through direct military action or simply by picking up the phone, and called his friend King Fahd. And within a very short time, Iraq would have been in a position to dominate the flow of oil to the world. Of course, he would have kept it flowing. He had every interest in doing so, but a price would have been paid, mainly in the third world. If you care about people in the third world starving, economies going bankrupt, why should Saddam Hussein be the one who drives much of the world into a depression? I don't think that was, I mean, that is what the oil issue is about. It's the impact on the world economy. There is a secondary concern about this man controlling the oil resources. I don't give a damn about what we pay at the gas pump. I'd rather pay $3 oil, uh, a gallon for gas and not be so dependent upon Middle East oil. But we as a nation haven't chosen to do that. But what I do care about is the hundreds of billions of dollars over the next five to 10 years that would have flowed into the coffers of Saddam Hussein, knowing that he has programs to build nuclear weapons, that he has programs to build missiles, 
that he has also already used chemical weapons against Iran. Did anybody here care about that? I happened to. I thought it was terrible that our country didn't say a word when chemical weapons were used. Did we care when he used chemical weapons against Kurds? Well, I actually did. I don't know who else did. But this is a man who will do it again. It is a regime that has demonstrated by its past behavior that it is prepared to inflict enormous casualties on its own people and on its neighbors. Now, are we really prepared to say as a people that at this particular phase in our history, we don't give a damn about that? That we don't care if we're setting the stage for a possibly nuclear war in the mid-1990s between Iraq and Israel? It would have happened. Uh, Israel would not have sat by and watched Israel and Iraq acquire nuclear weapons. Now, there are a lot of complaints I have about the way we're conducting this war. We're hitting too many civilian targets. We're hitting too much of the economic infrastructure. But I have no qualms in my own mind with reversing the aggression against Kuwait and doing it with force since there was no other alternative. Now, there's a... Uh, Dr. Quant, we thank you very much for sharing your experience.